Um, uh, as Susan said, I want to talk to you about improving youth mental health transitions and service coordination through experience-based co-design. I'm going to be focusing on the three studies that Susan just referred to, but I'm also going to give you a little bit about some of the other things I've been uh, working on. Um, and uh, I guess I want to start from the position that experiences matter. Okay. Um, I don't know if you mentioned, Susan, prior to joining McMaster, I worked at the Mental Health Commission of Canada, working on the national strategy. And that really framed a lot of my thinking and my approach when I did join McMaster, which was six years ago. And one of the things that comes out of the recovery movement, I'm sure most of you have heard of recovery. Anybody not familiar with that term? Just put your hand up. Everybody know? Not everyone's head's nodding. So recovery is a bit of a different viewpoint around mental health, um, that we don't just have to look for cure and have people well medically, but we need to make sure that they have a meaningful life. And I'll get into that a little bit more. And part of that is saying we need to improve services to reflect people's experiences. So that's kind of what this first point is about. Lived experience is critical to improving mental health services. Um, and that's increasingly being recognized in research to improve policy and practice. And this experience-based co-design approach is one that came out of the UK. I'm not going to belabor it because some of you are familiar with it, but not everyone is, so I want to give you a flavor. And I think one of the distinguishing features of that approach, and it came from Glenn Robert, who Susan knows as well, and Paul Bate in the UK, is um, to really focus on the aesthetics of experiences. And we do this for other product design, we do that for other services, but not as much in healthcare traditionally. I know we're all moving that way and we're trying to push the needle for sure. Um, we often think of function and safety, but we don't always think about the experience. So that's the piece that this is trying to add. And so as I say, when I worked at the Mental Health <coughs> Commission, I did work on the mental health strategy and I had the privilege of talking to people across the country through stakeholder consultations from all different viewpoints and all different perspectives. And what came out of the strategy, you can see it's a fairly high priority, number 2.2 is to actively involve people living with mental health problems and illnesses and their families in making decisions about service systems. That sounds great, right? One of the questions for me, how do you do that, right? And some of the other things that came out were really trying to shift ideas in policy making and in service delivery. How do we shift how we think about things? And so some of the other goals were, you know, well-being for everyone. So we're not just going to think about people with mental illness in this box over here as you know being a focus. It's it's about well-being for everyone, promotion and prevention, as well as promoting recovery. And so the implication of that is to really foster social inclusion rather than stigma. We are all struggling at some level with mental health and mental uh, mental health issues. Um, recovery, living a satisfying, hopeful, and contributing life, even if you might have an ongoing limitation. Right? But that's no reason to stop you having a wonderful life. And it means uh, not the same as cure. It's not necessarily cure that we're focused on here. And it definitely extends beyond treatment in terms of the services that we need to offer. And then empowering people to make choices, um, fostering greater self-determination in their care, and a lot more hope. And so that implication is really about mutuality and genuine partnership with professionals. So it's quite a paradigm shift from what we've seen in the past. So as I say, when I got to McMaster, my question is, okay, how do we do this? And so that's really where my research um, program has been heading, and how do we really incorporate lived experience into health policy and service design? And these are some of the areas I've been working on that are not what I'm going to focus on today, but just to give you a bit more of the context, when I first arrived, I was involved in participatory policy research to develop a new child uh, and youth mental health and addictions framework for the Yukon Territory. So that was more traditional policy research, um, participatory in that youth and family were involved, but lots of other stakeholders, but not experience driven per se. Um, and that work is now being implemented across the Yukon Territory. Second is evaluation of a primary care wraparound model in Halton, the Caroline family's first program, if you're familiar with that, really unique program, again, using um, more traditional qualitative research approaches. More recently, a, a research collaboration with Norway where we're looking at integration of peer support in clinical settings and how do we do that well? Um, what, do, what, do, what do we need to make them really part of the team? And engaging vulnerable and disadvantaged populations in the co-production of public services is what we launched, and Susan was part of this in Birmingham, England, a new collaborative to say, how do you do this work well with vulnerable populations? Youth with mental disorders being one example, 
health services being one type of public service, but there's lots of others, and I'll let you know a little bit more about that after. But where I want to focus is this experience-based co-design and the three studies that we have uh, had, had ongoing um, in this area. And I think it's a really promising method uh, for health systems and service enhancement to take that recovery orientation and put it into practice. Um, in this approach, people with lived experience work collaboratively with a family member of choice. Um, it, it may be an actual family member, but it could be another lay support person and staff to translate experiences into service redesign. Um, and this lived experience being central to the approach is the critical piece. Why do we want to do this? Well, to promote better communication and understanding. Um, often, youth with mental disorders, family members, and service providers can be quite polarized in their perspectives, and sometimes, you know, youth are cut off from their families. It's a very stressful time for everyone. Some families are incredibly supportive, so I don't want to generalize, but we do see that happen. And so how do we get these people working together collaboratively to come up with solutions that work from all perspectives? Um, and also, Experience-based co-design traditionally was done in like one service. It was started in a head and neck unit uh, for head and neck cancer unit of one hospital. We're trying to do this across multiple organizations that are serving youth. So we want to see how well it works and of course to share what we've learned as we're doing today. So there's several stages to EBCD um, and it's flexible. Susan mentioned the King's Fund toolkit which is great and extremely helpful starting point, but from my perspective, what we learned and what we certainly heard in Birmingham is it's not about steps, it's about principles and how do we do this right and be very, very flexible and responsive. But to get us started, certainly the first stage is understanding experiences and there can be different ways of doing that. And we look at three perspectives. We don't just look at the patient's experience or the per young person's experience, but also the family and the service provider's experiences. Uh, we identify touch points where experiences are powerfully shaped. And what I mean by a touch point is anywhere there's a really strong emotional response. So that's our cue when we're looking at the data. I felt really happy. I felt dismissed or disrespected. Feeling type statements, anything very emotional. Okay? Focus groups to obtain feedback and prioritize those touch points. Did we get it right when we looked at the data? And then a co-design event where all three perspectives work together to try to come up with solutions that work from all those various um, perspectives. Implementation is one word here, but it's way more complicated than that, and I'm not going to get into it today. That's where a lot of our research is focusing right now. How do we take what we've designed and make implementation happen? And evaluation, again, it looks like it's the end point, but in fact, it's throughout, right? We're doing ongoing process evaluation as well as at the end. So the three studies that I want to, well, I'm going to focus on two. The first two, improving coordination of care, um, improving transitions to adult care, and then improving employment supports for youth with mental disorders so that as they uh, move into employment, how do we help get them there and keep them there. So the study I'm going to focus on first is uh, a transition study in Hamilton and Halton regions. Um, you can see there's a wide range of organizations involved, which adds to the complexity of getting this implemented and coming up with solutions that work across organizations. It's very much grassroots, so while they're all involved, it's not like they've all officially signed on. We've re either recruited youth or staff or family members through these organizations, and they're staying involved, but very much from the grassroots level. Our next step is to get that sort of more official and moving things into practice. So the idea here, of course, was to try to improve experiences as people transition from child to adult services. And I'm sure most of you know this is a really critical um, point in the system where people often fall through the cracks. You turn 18, you may have been in child services and doing very well. Suddenly the funding stops because it's a different ministry. And we have different referral processes, different philosophies and approaches to care. And even if you get transferred in, people often drop out because it's such a culture shock. So lots of issues here to explore in terms of experiences. And of course, to make real service improvements in Hamilton and Halton. So prior to this study, uh, my colleague Dr. Glenn Randall at McMaster uh, did the Ontario Transition Study where we really got 
the lay of the land. So I want you to understand there's a huge amount of research prior to us even launching this experience-based co-design. I think there were eight or nine systematic reviews that came out of that and 78 interviews with healthcare providers, youth, family members, and policymakers from child services, from adult services, from transition services in between, from all of those perspectives. And that's what we drew on for our experience data. So you can see here, our participants originally were coming, it was secondary analysis of the data from that study. We then did focus groups where we wanted to make sure that we what we heard there resonated with our participants, and we developed experience maps, which I'll go into, and then a co-design event to develop the prototype improvements, which we're now trying to move toward implementation. Lots of support from a steering committee with youth and family representation, researchers from across the province, different ministries, and the CMHA as well. So starting in then with our focus group. So when we analyzed the data, we came up with, I believe it was 37 touch points for youth from their data, from those interviews. Um, about 65 from family members and 66. Well, it's one, 65 and 66, I'm not sure which is which, for service providers and family members. And so what we did was we brought our participants together in focus groups by type. So there would be a focus group for the youth participants, one for family members, and one from service providers. And we said, okay, did we get it right in identifying these touch points? And did what other people in the province say resonate with your experience as well? So to do that, we used what's called a card sorting technique, where if you look here, the, the, at the top, the relief from diagnosis was one of the touch points. I felt relief, so you're seeing that emotion experience. And here would be a sample quote. I know you can't read this, but it, I'll read it to you. It was not something wrong with me. It wasn't something I was doing on purpose. It was something that was happening to me. And so this was a touch point as they entered child services, so at the beginning of this whole journey. Um, these are just three I randomly selected for youth. Um, feeling the age cut off is completely arbitrary. It's like this magical number that at 18, and now all of a sudden you're an adult, but what really makes me any different? Uh, I'm literally just a day older, that's it. I'm not any more experienced or prepared to be in an adult service. Okay? And then frustration and disappointment during the transition phase. Whoops. That's weird. <laughs> um, I was just kept in the dark, and it would have been really nice to know what was happening, or if they got my referral, or if it's being processed, or if anything else is going to happen. I didn't know anything, which is frustrating, right? So you're seeing the emotion statements here. And as I say, these are just sample cards that we asked people to go through in pairs and sort through and say, nah, that doesn't matter. Or, you know what, that really resonates and it's a really high priority, make sure we get that in there. Or, you know what, you're missing something. They triggered it for people to think of something else in their experience. So this is just a tool. And we had um, people work in pairs so that they would, you know, particularly the youth who might have social anxiety, you know, feel comfortable working together. And then they presented them to the rest of the participants who could weigh in and say, you know what, no, you're wrong, or yes, or modify it, okay? So this was a really important stage in making sure and eliciting experiences. See here, well, we got great feedback on the touch points, support for most of them, modifications, so we would edit them and change them to the wording matched better, and suggestions for some new ones. And then what came out of this rich source of data was experience maps for each perspective, which I'll show you in a moment, a combined experience map, problems and need statements from each perspective, design principles, things that people felt really strongly about in any solution that we came up with, and four touch points that we took to the co-design event. So again, I know you can't read this, but this is just to give you a flavor of what one experience map looked like. This was for the youth. Each of the blocks are the touch points that they told us where to put. Now these maps were the size of these two screens together on the wall, and they had their cards, we had bigger versions, they told us where to put this on the map. You can see along the horizontal axis is basically time, right? It's the stages of the transition journey. And you might think we would start here at transition, but this is how people are telling us their experiences, and they want to start at the beginning. Right? or sometimes they jump in part way, but we kind of broke it down by stage of the journey. And here is how, how strongly they felt. This was a negative touch point, and the lower down, the worse it was. Top is a high touch point, and again, how positive it was. So this is from the youth experience. 
We did the same thing from the family member's experience. We did the same thing from the service provider's experience. So at this point, we're drowning in about 150 touch points, right, from the different experiences. And I think the other thing I need to point out, whoops, without touching it, is the comment bubbles. <laughs> and the comment bubbles are important because we didn't force people to agreement, right? If they disagreed, we wanted to capture that. So we were trying to cluster where there was most agreement, but allowing for differences, okay? Also, if there was a really compelling statement someone made, we captured that in the comment bubble. So then we said, okay, where to begin? Let's see, what, what does this look like if we compare common touch points? So where you said this was an issue, family members said it was an issue, and service providers said it was an issue. Might have been for different reasons. They might have had very different viewpoints, but there was a common touch point. We said, okay, let's start there. And we landed on, I think it's 17, common touch points, so that was a huge reduction in and of itself. But in this case, the comment bubbles are actually reflecting the different perspectives on the same touch point, okay? Um, and the other thing I, I should mention about the, this process is, while the content was important, the process was equally important. So it wasn't just about the data we gathered, but what happened in these focus groups is that you saw a, a participants moving from I had this experience, right, to we had this experience. You, t you had the same thing as me. I'm not alone in this. And that strengthens the voice of the participants to bring to a co-design event with the other viewpoints. Okay, so it's very empowering for people. Again, I don't expect you to read all this, but I have it there so you'll have the data to look at. But we, think, we, we felt, as I say, we were drowning in this, and we had to kind of get it simple. Like, what's the root issue from each perspective? So youth face the problem of being able to make a timely and smooth transition between child to adult mental health services at a time of many developmental changes towards adulthood. So this is something we heard really strongly, you know. Not only removing service systems, but, you know, now you want me to be an adult, and, or, or sometimes you're treating me like a child, and, you know, feeling really mixed up between the two. So they need a system that supports them through this process. Nice, simple statement. Similarly, family members, often it pertains to information, not having the information they need to do their jobs as family members to support people. And service providers really wanting to support people, but all kinds of obstacles, systems-based obstacles that are getting in the way. Down below are the design principles, and these are akin to value statements, where people say, this is how the world ought to be. This is what should happen. And so youth had, for example, a commitment to support. They, they should be getting support. They're in need here. There's a should. Personalization and choice. No financial barriers. Feeling respected. Flexibility to their personal needs and upholding rights. Okay. Well, if we look across, we start to see, from the family member's perspective, some similarities. Um, feeling heard and validated with feeling respected over here. Balancing right to privacy and need for information sharing. Policy and organizational support. So really key pieces from each perspective that whatever we designed needed to be reflected. Okay? And then we said, okay, we're going to have to take a leap here and try to get those 17 touch points down to a manageable number to work on at a co-design event. So our team worked together and we validated these with our participants to say, will these work if we use these four? And the first three are kind of one from each perspective, and the fourth is kind of an overarching, and we did this because of how we designed our events. So service providers are trying to help youth transition, but obstacles exist. Services are not matched to youth developmental needs. Families feeling shut out of adult services. And youth turning 18 is the overarching one, feeling stuck on a wait list or without services. So how did we do the co-design event? Well, first of all, everybody was there, right? We brought back all the participants that we could. Obviously, some couldn't make it. Um, and we tried for balance in the room. The first step in working in small groups was to clarify the why. And what we mean by that is we asked our group participants to say, what is the root of the problem here? Why does this problem exist? And then we kept asking and probing until we got to something really tangible they could work on. Then it's this inverted stoplight, we call it. So the green was to just brainstorm ideas individually. Everyone wrote on a sticky note, fast, as quickly as you can. Give them a few minutes, just brainstorm everything at the top of your head. No wrong ideas. Yellow, we asked them to share with their own group. 
to slow down and we started clustering these in terms of that's a great idea we got to go with it to you know what I like it but it needs some more work and so forth and then at the red light we said okay we got to stop we got to define what our solution is. We have to make this time-based, or people will never pass, move past their, um, their experiences towards their solutions. And then we said, okay, you need to develop a prototype. And by that, we just mean a visual representation, a drawing of some sort. So they did this, the first round, they did this in their own group to get comfortable. So youth work together on a solution, family members work together on their own touch point, service providers worked on theirs. And then, they, then we had a carousel where people moved from one group to the other to enhance each other's solutions, okay, to come up with something they all felt worked. They then presented to the whole group in plenary and um, collectively, you know, sort of endorsed the solutions. So to do that took 90 minutes, okay, for the first round. In the second round, we said, okay, you're comfortable now, let's try you in mixed groups. And that worked really, really well because by then, as soon as those presentations happened, as soon as they saw each other's work, we were on an even playing field. You could have heard a pin drop when the youth presented their solution to the rest of the group, and you could just see the change in the power <coughs> dynamic. You know, the service providers are like, wow, and the family members were blown away, and suddenly they were equals in the room. So, what do prototypes look like? Well, here are some examples. They're on the fly work. Um, this one is the one from the youth perspective where they said, you know what, here are what our goals are. We want to combine, we want to address both access and communication in order to sort of match this issue around not meeting youth developmental needs. The green and the red are the things that the other groups added to it. So I can't remember which is which, but green would be family members maybe and red would be service providers. And then down at the bottom, what they developed was an online portal, okay, to address both access and communication. Across the top is a search bar where they could get credible information that they needed. Inside, they drew who all the groups are that they would communicate between, so the youth could communicate to service providers who could communicate with each other, family members, that the youth would have control over who would it, the information was shared with. And down the left, they want access to their own account information. They wanted people, they wanted not to have to tell their story over and over again, prescription information and a transitions protocol, and so on. So that's just to give you a sense of what could be captured in one of these prototypes. On the right, this was really cool because this was hugely visionary in my mind. Um, this was, this squiggly line is basically saying, you know what, we want no age cutoff. This is about a person. These age cutoffs have to do with systems. It's about a person who's journeying through life, and this squiggly line, you can see the word life, and that during life we have developmental stages, and those are kind of the loops where, you know, people are at risk. And so we can predict those statistically. We know the age groups where people are at risk. And these dotted lines of circles around them, we should be able to develop services in advance, knowing about these things for developmental needs. The lines coming down are crisis or breakpoints, and we need a different set of services for that. Right? And so this was quite visionary. It's not something we're taking forward at the moment, but um, I think it was just really fascinating that people could really think outside the box, throw the system away, and start fresh. How do we do this? So since then, we've been refining the prototypes. So this is the portal done a little bit more nicely. <laughs> and further refinement working in small groups of our participants. They prioritized which ones they wanted to take forward, and the por portal was one. And we're continuing to gather and refine data on that by going out to different organizations and talking to more youth. This one is um, a navigator function, which the family members were most interested in, where it basically says no matter what the portal is into the system, whether it's schools, the ER, self-referral, and so on, there should be some kind of a navigator function that will allow them to be assigned a navigator, have team building around the youth, education and resource linkage and some key principles down um, down at the bottom the navigator is not going to be the educator but link people to educators in the system not be the counselor but provide informal support for caregivers and really important here understanding the youth needs supporting the emotional needs of caregivers really getting to know the youth some of the time-based stuff we can't normally Another one that we're working in with those other two is a transitions planning protocol that they felt very strongly about. They said, this isn't news. We know people are going to transition. They're 16. We know at 18. Why can't we start two years in advance and start working on this? Um, and so the various steps 
The other thing I think that's really interesting is the youth really wanted to try out adult services. You know, they said, we go to universities and we check out the campus and we talk to people and we get a feel for it. Why can't we do that with adult services? With planning, we could do that ahead of time. A whole repository of supports to help them and so on. So as I say, they're prototypes, they're not fully developed, but this is what you can get in 90 minutes or 45 minutes if you get the right people in the room. So next steps, we've conducted three development team meetings to refine the prototypes. We're now taking a different approach. One of the things that's very difficult is keeping youth engaged, in part because they're struggling perhaps with episodic illness, or they're not um, stably housed, or their um, you know, employment is precarious, and so it can be hard to keep them engaged. So we're now trying new approaches that engage them, where we're going to where the youth are. Um, and then our plan is in September or perhaps October to be holding a knowledge exchange event where we bring management in and say, okay, how do we get concrete about moving these forward as they're further refined? Briefly. Um, so this is another study where uh, it's very similar except how we're gathering the experience data, okay? Um, again, and this one is looking at coordination of care and transitions both. Um, and this is about a suite of apps that we've developed called My Experience Apps or My XP to capture experiences in real time. Because what we saw in the last study is we used old data and tried to bring it up to date. But what if we could respond to people's negative experiences as they're happening? What if we could respond to their positive experiences and do more of it? So that's kind of what's behind this. So can we apply experience-based code design in this cross-organizational systems context so it's not linked to just one system? And can we use real-time person-centered data gathering to do this? And so we've developed this suite of apps and uh, we've run this study so we know that uh, they're, they're, they're working very well on a pilot basis. And uh, the other thing this does, so there's a smartphone app for youth and a web application for family members and service providers. So again, we're looking at all three perspectives on every appointment that the youth goes through the system with. It brings data collection literally into the hands of the users. It's a technology that youth are very comfortable with. Um, it gives us those multiple perspectives on every service contact over the service journey. So really important when you're looking at something like transitions and coordination of care. And where we see it exciting is possibility is to move experience-based co-design into ongoing quality improvement. We had to think a lot about things to get this app right, and uh, domains of experience came from the literature around what's most important to youth in mental health. Uh, continuity of care dimensions, so looking at not just when they're at an appointment, but prior to going into the appointment. How are they feeling about an upcoming appointment? Once they arrive, their interactions with the provider. Once they exit, how do they feel after they've left? When they transition to a new provider or leave a previous provider? Obviously, it's a challenging demographic, right? And they're pretty tech savvy, so we've got to stay, you know, kind of uh, nimble, which I can't say we've done yet, but I think we did okay with the first round. It has to be highly engaging, easy to use, uh, quick, but not an intervention at the same time. We're not actually trying to change things. We're trying to understand experiences as they are now that can be changed in future iterations, but for our purposes. And we have to coordinate all three perspectives and be used at any stage. They could be in child services, they could be in adult services. So you've got to write your questions in a really neutral way. Attention to stigma and privacy issues are obviously paramount. So the home screen, it's pretty simple. Um, there's a questionnaire that they fill out after every appointment. They enter upcoming appointments in the calendar, and then following an appointment, they get a notification to say, please finish this, fill out this questionnaire. Family members and service providers right now get it at night because we figured they probably wouldn't do it right after the appointment. Um, they get a prompt every Sunday night to say you've got any upcoming appointments this week, or they can enter it as they're booked, either way. Uh, there's online resources they can use at any time. Um, and my comments is uh, open-ended journal they can use any time they want to use. Um, very simple uh, screen where we use this combination of an emotion face scale because we're really trying to probe emotions here. Um, how did you feel when you arrived? Click. And if you don't want to do anything else, you just swipe to the next one. Uh, or if you want to give more detail, you tap the button and you record your experiences. Okay. Um, this is the entire design of the app, so I won't touch the screen, but across the top is the entire intake survey, so seven questions, you're done. So snap, 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 snap. So it gives them a chance to download the app, 
look at the questions, understand the types. It could be a yes or no type question. Um, and just to film, familiarize them. I can say that by the time I explained to them how to download the app, they had already finished this question. <laughs> they had it downloaded and finished. Um, the middle is the actual questionnaire post a typical appointment. So 11 screens, again, very quickly in and out. Um, did you meet with the provider as planned? Did you meet with another provider at the same time? Uh, is this a first ongoing or last appointment? And then the seven core questions, which have to do with feelings when they arrive, feelings about the provider, feelings about information sharing, family involvement, the treatment plan, how did they feel after leaving, and their overall experience. Then a thank you and links to resources. If they didn't meet with the provider as planned, there's a little you know, uh, loop around that. If they're transitioning to a new provider, a loop around that. So very quick. And this is critical because if you don't make it quick, they won't continue to do it. Family and provider experiences, as I said, were uh, very similar questions tailored to their perspective. So we had to be neutral. The family may or may not have attended the appointment, depending if it was a child service or an adult service, and so on. So just to give you a sense, and I actually I realized I put the wrong slide in here, so I'm just going to read you what the slide should say. Um, so this, this is uh, touch points from an, um, interviews, not from the app. So this just give you a sense of what you can get out of an app, because that was one of our big questions, right? Will youth actually share anything on this app? Will they actually take the time to, to fill that in? And so about an upcoming appointment, one youth told us, well, she and I, meaning their service provider, booked this appointment together, yet I'm still very much worried about it and how it will turn out. Good information for a service provider to have, right, in real time. About the provider, I won't be meeting with a particular doctor for a long time, and I'm kind of upset about that. Um, another youth, I would not share my feelings with this doctor. Like, end of story. So why are they seeing this doctor, right? Treatment plan, I don't want to do treatment type anymore. And in this case, we were quite surprised it was ECT for a young person and was like, okay. Exiting a program, well, it was the last group session, so it was a little bittersweet, but there's post-treatment options and a booster group, group every month in case you need a little help in the future. So I'm feeling pretty good about being able to keep going on my own. I was like, all that in an app? Pretty useful information, right? Um, the overall experience. I feel very disappointed with my experiences with the service. I don't feel heard or trusted by this service. I never have, um, even with my eight different workers that I've had in the last two years that I've been involved with for this service. So again, really, I think, valuable information. And we also would get that, of course, from the family member and the service provider. So, in terms of this study, I think what we learned to date is that, you know, there's some real potential here with technology as a way to engage youth uh, demographic. It's definitely less stigmatizing for them. Um, multiple viewpoints on a single encounter. They don't feel that pressure of sitting down face to face with a provider and, and you know, trying to give feedback. They feel much better doing it through the app. Um, in terms of benefits to the research, the data you know, collection follows the user. So we actually get a sense of where are they going? What are all the services that they're using? And then you can use big data analysis, if this were bigger, to say how do we optimize that flow and where are the bottlenecks in the system? It also opens up the black box of sort of real-time experience. What's going on between appointments? How are people feeling? How do they feel after their appointments? We see there's lots of potential for other applications, evaluation studies, rapid improvement cycles, um, and so on other ages and health concerns. It's not unique to this group. So to wrap up, um, lessons for experience-driven policy and service improvement. I think what we see when we involve lived experience is you know, that the solutions naturally encompass recovery ideas. Youth and families are not stuck in traditional ideas. Over and over again, we'd see them come up with creative solutions, and the service provider said, yeah, but, you know, because they're much more focused on how is the world right now, and what are the limitations on what I can do right now? Here's a chance to, to sort of breathe some new life into that, and yet have the balance. It's not pie in the sky, so you aren't looking at what those realities are at the same time. I think the grassroots process involving multiple uh, uh, organizations really is this opportunity to overcome barriers to care coordination. It was fascinating when we brought the service providers together for the first time. Like For the youth, it was this sort of 
oh, I'm, I'm nervous kind of thing. But the service provider sort of had these walls up, right? Well, this is how we do things, and there could be things wrong with it. And they actually feel pretty vulnerable. They probably feel just as vulnerable as the youth do, if not more so, when this is starting out. Um, but here's a chance. Over time, they got to know each other. They got to understand why they do things differently. Um, but it's not as simple as a toolkit. I mean, we really have to be very skillful in the facilitation. We need to be flexible and adaptable. You never know. We've had a youth you know, go off all medication two days before the event and show up and, you know, how do you respond to that and still get everything done? Um, it's empowering for family members and youth and even for service providers, I should add, I would say many of them, you know, really, really want to make a big difference and make change happen but don't feel empowered to do that. Um, and we started to see this real respect develop and starting to feel very safe working together, which they didn't feel at the beginning. And finally, this recognition of shared principles and values being so important uh, to making that happen. Uh, so, I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Thanks. and Thanks. happy to hear you.